If you thought Moscow was all about enormous roads clogged with traffic, ugly new buildings, or doors being shut in your face because the museum or shop you're visiting is having a strangely named technical break, think again. Moscow and its surrounding towns and cities are full of beautiful churches, museums, lakes, and forests. And all you need is a little determination and a sturdy pair of shoes to find them. Phoebe Taplin is a journalist and author who's writing a series of books about walks you can take in Moscow, which show the reader where to go in order to see the city's many treasures. Phoebe has written two books so far about autumn walks and winter walks. Her book about spring walks is about to be published, and she's just starting work on her final book in the series about walks in summer. Phoebe came to live in Moscow because her husband, a journalist, was posted there. She soon started taking long walks and discovering hidden sides of the city. I started our interview by asking Phoebe whether her walks helped her to cope with moving to a new city. Definitely, definitely, it, it, it's a virtuous circle. I mean, the more you throw yourself into it, the more you end up. Your Russian gets better anyway because you're out and about. You have to talk to people and you're learning vocab on the job and so on. But also. I think it helps you to love it to have a project, and actually,、uh, it's totally true that a lot of people do complain. I mean, there are things to complain about the traffic, but actually, increasingly, I see a lot of people doing in different ways what I've done. Now, to talk about your books, you've already published your book of Moscow walks for winter. It's a very attractive book, and. I've got to say, though I lived in Moscow ten years myself, I'm now longing to get on the first flight back and visit some of the places you mention in the book. Excellent. Did you want to show that Moscow and its surrounds can be very beautiful? Did you want to get away from the Moscow that's shown on the news? Totally. I don't know about getting away from the Moscow on the news so much as the Moscow that is the sort of cliche in all our heads, where you know there's this. Picture of Red Square, and there's a picture of you know the Kremlin, and that's about all anybody ever gets to see.、Uh, and for me, the thing that really turned Moscow around for me was actually that the parks and forests and things like that, that actually these sort of incredible natural treasures that we don't at all associate with our image of Moscow, for me were what made me fall in love with it as a city. We lived very close to the Timiryazovsky Park when we first arrived. It's a sort of forested park, full of birch trees, full of anemones in the spring, full of field fairs and、uh, all kinds of ducks and things. I mean, it was this extraordinary nature reserve, really, in in the heart of the of the northern suburbs. And that was one of the things that made me realise that Russia was somewhere I could really enjoy being. Was exploring those those forests. So. Yes, I was wanting to get away from the ideas that everybody had about Moscow, but also just to share some of the enjoyment that I'd had there.、I、had a lot of great adventures, and these books are a, a sort of culmination of that. There's an autumn one out already as well, so that came out last October, and then this one just recently, and the spring one is now is being worked on. <laughs> so, could you pick out a, a highlight from the spring book for our listeners? Is there is there something unusual that people might not expect? Definitely, lots of things.、Um, th- for me, one of the big highlights are the trips out of town. So、um, a lot of them are things that don't appear in any English language guidebook at all at the moment. So they're kind of pretty much unique. And probably my favourite trip out of town in that whole book. Oh, that's、uh, difficult. Actually, I'll have to do two. Sorry, do you mind? Okay, so the first one would be the town of Kolomna, which was off limits during the Cold War, which may be the reason it's not. It was a secret military、uh, base. It's now open to tourists. They've refurbished the beautiful Kremlin, very high walls. They make their own honey wine there, which is the local label has the Kremlin on it, and it's surrounded by apple orchards. It's a beautiful place, about a、uh, hundred kilometers south of Moscow. Very easy to get to on the bus and the train. And because of all these apples, one of their local specialities are apple sweets. They're a bit like a cross between sort of marshmallows and Turkish delight, only nicer because they're really apple juice based. And they have a museum there where they all dress up in old-fashioned nineteenth-century costumes and make these sweets. And they're really welcoming. And I went there once in the snow. They gave me a cup of tea. And here you must try some of us. And you can buy a little box with Catherine the Great on it for three hundred rubles and take it. It's all. Fantastic place, and it's in an old 18th-century manor house with a courtyard. When I was there, there was a, a donkey made out of apples in the courtyard. I mean, that was the kind of thing 
that I absolutely loved and I found that very, very exciting trip. And the other trip in that book, Out of Town Trip, is to Palienova, which is the estate of the painter Vasily Palienov on the banks of the Oka River. That's an even longer one. There's sort of two and a half hours each way but worth it. The river's very spectacular. The house itself is like a museum. It's full of paintings. It's full of his paintings. It's full of paintings by his friends, so Levitan and, and Repin and all kinds of people have paintings in there. And his studio, that's like a little chapel, full of light, full of painter's pots and old puppets that he made for the children. And then you can walk down to the river and you can walk all the way along the Oka River, which is very broad and beautiful. He painted it a lot of times, so it looks very familiar from his paintings. And then you get to this church that he also built, sort of Art Nouveau church on the hill. And it's just amazing. And also what is unusual about it is it is a very well-kept museum with a cafe, with a kind of tourist centre. And that kind of thing is still not absolutely to be taken for granted. So it is still a, generally a process of adventure. But this is a, a very pleasant, well-kept adventure compared with some of them. <laughs> well, there are pockets, aren't there, of Russia where internal tourism has developed quite astoundingly in the last decade or so. Absolutely, absolutely. And and Kolomna would be one of them, actually. I mean, they've done a fantastic job. They're doing it up. They've got some great museums. They've got some nice cafes, very, very friendly, well-versed uh, tourist managers. So, yes, there are definitely places where it has come a long way. There's still places where it hasn't. I mean, for me, that was half the fun. You seem to have a very positive attitude towards Russia, which is is fantastic. But I wondered as well, I sometimes found in Moscow that it would depend on your mood. If you were having a difficult day, you can find Moscow difficult and the other way around. The, the winter actually has less of an influence on mood, I think, than people think it would have. Definitely, definitely. And I think that's totally true. Actually, that's a very interesting point to the mood thing. Vedenha, which is one of my favourite places, that's somewhere that I've been and it sometimes just looks like a bit of a run-down fairground and you think, what, what are we doing here? And other times I go and I think it's the most spectacular place I've ever seen and the pavilions and the architecture, which is very, it's a sort of Stalin-era um, extravaganza. It can be depressing and it can be absolutely magical and you go there in the snow, a brilliant blue sky and you go, oh, this is incredible. Definitely the mood thing. Actually, it's interesting, my... Um, my love of walking, I think, is a family thing. And my mother, who has written books about uh, walking herself and a lot of nature poetry and things, she's embroidered this, this scarf I'm wearing now. And it says, uh, jog on, jog on merry heart on it, which is a quote from Winter's Tale. Jog on, jog on the footpath way and merrily hent the styler. Merry heart goes all the, all the day, a sad tiles in a mile. And that's, that's it's almost my motto. I mean, I think a merry heart, we were all in a big band together, walking through Moscow, through the woods, and it was great fun and we didn't notice the miles and we didn't notice the weather but I think if you're feeling unhappy about things then yes it's it's hard to make any headway and especially in Moscow it can make your problems worse it's a, it's a difficult environment to be in if you're not happy and I think that's that is a, it is a really important uh, difference between you know people who want to make the most of it can make all kinds of things happen and people who are feeling like they have problems, as we were to some extent towards the end, then find it a difficult environment to be in. What about the more gritty realities of, of Moscow life? I know from my own experience that you can go to a beautiful forest and then you become very disappointed as you see a pile of rubbish in it. Do you just close your eyes to those things? <laughs> and it's really funny you say that because it's totally true. Uh, the, the rubbish thing is, I, I call it the, the sort of teenager's bedroom theory of, of countryside management, that there's this day in March or whenever it is when the snow is sort of melting, when everyone goes out with big plastic sacks and picks up all the rubbish that's appeared from under the snow drifts. And then suddenly for a couple of weeks it looks quite tidy in the woods. If they didn't do that, it really would be horrific. Some places are. <laughs> uh, but it's like a teenager's bedroom where you just let it get messier and messier and then you go and clear it up and people think they've got a right to just leave rubbish everywhere. And it's a cultural thing. I mean, it's, a, you know, maybe something that will change gradually. You know, national parks were only introduced in the 1980s. But it's definitely, my husband used to tease me that I would come back with these pictures of beautiful landscapes. And you go, well, you just took that narrowly in between the guy that's lying there trunk on the ground and the big pile of rubbish and you took the bit that looks really nice in the middle. 
all. So you have to take a certain what, a reality filter sometimes with you. That's I mean, it's undeniable. I, I have tried to be honest about it in the books, but I've also explained that you need to have a sort of positive mindset. I mean, the, the autumn book, I actually started with a bit about the wild dogs in the forest, and the editors at Rear Novosti were saying, oh, this is terrible, you can't put this in, it'll put people off. Said, well, they, they've got to know what, uh, if you're going for a walk in the woods, it is possible that you'll encounter some of these ex-pets that are roaming the forests. And they're not generally harmful, but, you know, people need to be aware of, of that it's a different... It's a different setup when you're going for a walk there. And how have Russians reacted to your book? Very well. I mean, it's definitely not a cultural phenomenon in quite the same way as it is here, the idea of going for a walk just for fun, especially in an area that you don't know. I mean, obviously lots of people love walking there, going in their local park or around the dacha, but there isn't the same idea of let's go off for a 10-kilometre hike through the woods. I mean, people do it increasingly, but, but it, it hasn't got the same kind of tradition as, as here. I've seen a couple of Russian reviews of the books that have been very positive and people sort of saying, I've been past this tram route, for instance, I suggested as a sightseeing route every day for years and I've never occurred to me that it, it could be a nice place to just ride and look at the scenery, you know, and what an extraordinary thing to have a foreigner say to us that, that this might be a good idea. There definitely is a kind of a receptivity to these ideas of, of appreciating things in a slightly different way, in a, in a, in a more leisured way, I think. But, I, but yeah. I suppose the Russians do have their tradition of the long summer hikes. I've been on them. They're quite exhausting. Exhausting, But, yes. <laughs> but not maybe a mid, more middling walk like some of yours that are a bit more manageable or you don't have to have food supplies for two weeks for. Absolutely, no. That exa- I did, when I first arrived, I joined the um, Walkers, Hikers and Nature Lovers, which is a group that's probably 60% Russian in, in Moscow and then and then international. And we did things like crossing rivers on, on a log. One guy fell in, a sort of semi-frozen river, and we were wading through the snowdrifts. We weren't following paths. We were just going through the woods with a GPS. And it was seriously hardcore. I mean, it was an extraordinary adventure. It was absolutely exhausting. So, no, no, there is that, the, the adventurous tradition. Of course, there is very much so. But, yes, this is a particularly English concept, I think, of a sort of a little stroll through the more accessible areas. <laughs> I'm thinking of little strolls onto your summer book that yeah. you just started writing. Yes. And, uh, as you said to me, a lot of people wouldn't think that Moscow would have beaches and, and forests. Yes. I mean, this is one thing I love about it is surprising people with. I've got lots and lots of beach pictures and people go, is that really Moscow? Yes, that's the Moscow River. And I absolutely love the fact that, in fact, the first feature I ever wrote for the Moscow News was a roundup of places you could swim if you really wanted to in Moscow. And people clean then, enough, you mean? Well, clean enough is. I mean, some of them you have to be fairly brave to. You wouldn't probably want to put your head under too much and that kind of thing. But they can certainly cool you down. I mean, summer's very hot there. And there's some fantastic places along the Moscow River in the west of the city. So obviously, Serebriani Bor is one of the better known ones. The Silver Forest has some, some lovely, very well kept beaches. But my favourite is actually the other side of the river. And it d- hasn't made it as a beach walk into the book because it's got too much competition, but it's ran near Stragina. I've done it as a, as a winter walk. But the beach there in summer is beautiful. It's just sand. It's full of wild flowers. And there's a great view across to the village of Troitsalikova, which is on the far bank, with two very old churches, including an Erishkin Baroque church up on the cliff. And it's one of those places that, uh, for me, is part of the magic of Moscow. I was there on a summer's evening with a lot of other people barbecuing and and having little parties on the bank. And it, it just felt like a perfect place to be at that particular moment if you're going to be in the city. And there's a lot of places like that. I mean, it, they've also got these great historical connections. It's very hard to find a bit of water in Moscow that Peter the Great isn't supposed to have sailed his boat on. But uh, the, one of the things I loved was the beach walks. And actually, the, the trip out in the summer book to Alexander Bloch's house at Shakhmatova, again, something that hasn't made it into any tourist guides that I know of yet. I'm sure it will, because it's a beautiful place. That's near Solnechnogorsk, uh, Sun City, which has this huge lake which attracted a lot of artists and writers and so on. And that's a great place for swimming. You can fish and you can take boat rides and there are little cafes on the beach and sculpture gardens. And it's one of those places, it's just an hour out of Moscow on the bus, very easy to get to, that was a total revelation to me that there were places like that just out so there are a lot of hidden gems, really, definitely, still. Definitely, definitely. I mean, that's the kind of place that, for me, it completely made being in the city. You could just take a, a bus for an hour and you're in this holiday resort, really. Especially with children, I imagine, because they need to run around and 
Absolutely, absolutely. No, I mean, our kids definitely loved it. In fact, the, probably the most popular trip with them that we ever took, which is going to be in the summer book again, is to Likkarina, which is a little town outside Moscow. And they loved it. It's huge old sand mountains. And it's actually, the lake is an old quarry from mining optical quartzite for the glass industry there. So it's got this amazing kind of turquoise water and they completely loved it, the children, even though it was heaving, <laughs> full of other holiday makers, but very interesting. In the middle of the pine woods, white sand beaches, a little bit of rubbish, you have to ignore that. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Phoebe Taplin. Well, thank you for inviting me.